So far, I've only shown you the sample version of this formula. Notice that this is our formula for the line in our sample. The predicted score for an individual is simply the intercept plus the slope times the score on x for that individual. Now there is a corresponding version of this formula that refers to the population. That is, in the population, we are predicting something with beta zero, the true population intercept, plus beta one, the true population slope, multiplied by the score on x for an individual. Now what this is, is the mean for all individuals at a particular value of x. We write this as mu sub y given xi. And again, this is the mean on y for all individuals at a particular level of x. Notice that this model does not have an epsilon sub i, so we're not talking about individuals' actual scores, but rather the mean of all individuals who have a particular level of x. In our example, this would be the mean for all individuals on a final exam if they studied a particular amount, for instance, five hours. Remember, not every person who studies five hours is gonna have the same score, but everybody who studied five hours will have an average score, and so what we're predicting with this line on the right is the mean for all individuals at a particular amount of study. Let's actually see this on a diagram. To do this, I'm gonna to have to rotate things a little bit. So final percentage here is still on the y-axis and study time is still on the x, but we're looking at this on its side. Let me draw in the linear regression line. So beta zero plus beta one xi. This is the true population regression line. Now let me draw in the mu y given xi's. So for each amount of studying, one, three, five, seven, nine, and 11, there is some average amount that people at those hours of study would actually get on final percentage. Now remember, our general linear model always makes a particular assumption that air, that is individuals around some group mean, is normally distributed with a mean of zero and the same variance. So in the population, the way we would see this are normal distributions around this line. Take a second to absorb the meaning of this. In the population, individuals do not all get the same score, even if they study the same amount. And that's what these distributions represent. But notice that our line, our beta zero plus beta one xi, is not predicting individuals, it's predicting the mean of all individuals conditional on a particular level of x. So with this notation of the conditional mean, we can also write that the y scores are distributed normally with a mean of mu sub y given xi with a constant variance. Now I want you to notice that if we couch our model in this way, that is, we're predicting the conditional mean on the basis of a regression function, this actually starts to square nicely with how we were thinking about our models before. That is, in our sample, we're making a prediction for y, but that prediction is really just the mean of all people with a given amount of x. So like we did with our models before, I invited you to think about the center component of our model as just a group mean. Before, it was a group mean for a particular condition or for a particular treatment. Now, it's a group mean for a particular group of people at a particular amount of x. And so, what we're really doing with our one predictor model is saying that the score on y for an individual is the average of what everybody gets with the amount of x they have, plus however much they differ from the group mean of all people who have as much of x as they have. Now what's really clever about this regression model is that even though we're representing in the center portion a group mean, the conditional mean of y given xi, those means are all related to each other. That is, we don't have to represent them all separately in the way we did with a one-factor model. In a one-factor model, we had each of our group means and differences of those group means to the grand mean. But in a one-factor model, the means were of groups that are qualitatively different. But in this case, we have a quantitative x variable, and we know something about the relation between our y and x variable in a quantitative way. So we represent this mean in the center on the basis of our regression function. So with only two parameters, a beta zero and a beta one, we're able to talk about the mean on y for any individuals at a particular level of x. Because the conditional means have a relation, 
we only need to spend two parameters and we're able to talk about the mean for any group of people at a particular level of x. Now the final component of our model, the epsilon sub i's, will be important when we're actually testing this model. Now in the population, we just saw a diagram of those epsilon sub i's. Those are the distributions centered at the conditional mean of y given xi, and they have a constant variance. Now in our sample model, the e sub i's we've also seen before. That is, the e sub i's in our sample are simply the deviations between the individual observations and the line of fit. Here I actually have the actual regression function, 72.38, the y-intercept, plus 1.77x. Notice that if we plug in the value of x for any individual, we'll get the point on the line that these green bars connect to. So the residuals in our model are simply the deviations between what was actually observed for each of these students and the score that would be predicted for them on the basis of the line. In the next module, where we take up the topic of testing our linear models, it will be these residuals we'll turn to in order to form our guess about the population error. And like we've seen before, we'll be able to develop f-tests using the mean square of these residuals as a baseline for error.